In the dead of winter, on a remote frontier homestead, temperatures fell so brutally low that even thick log walls and roaring fireplaces could not keep a cabin warm through the night, while other settlers shivered, waking every two hours to feed their stoves. One pioneer slept in steady, luxurious heat, using a heating invention almost every neighbor mocked at first. They called it strange, foreign, even dangerous. Yet it was centuries older, far more efficient, and shockingly smarter than anything the region had ever seen. It was the Chinese Kong bed stove, a massive heated sleeping platform used across northern China for thousands of years, and this one man's decision to build it under his bunk would allow him to sleep warm for 10 hours straight, while using 60% less firewood than his neighbors just to survive. Before we dive into this remarkable true story, take a moment to subscribe to the channel. These historical innovations are disappearing from memory, and by subscribing you help keep these stories alive, and ensure you never miss the next one. In the 1800s, settlers across northern territories faced a brutal challenge, maintaining warmth in cabins built quickly often with green timber, poorly sealed joints, and crude stone hearths. A standard wood stove consumed vast amounts of fuel, yet delivered uneven heat, hot when burning, freezing once the fire died. Most pioneers went through entire cords of wood in a single season, and still spent nights trembling under blankets. But the pioneer in our story, his name now lost to time but preserved through journals, and local accounts had lived years earlier among Chinese laborers in parts of northern China while traveling with a trading company. There he witnessed something that astonished him, families heating entire homes with a single fire, wood piles half the size of the American frontiers, and beds so warm that even in ice-laden winters people slept without shivering. The secret was the Kang a massive platform of brick, stone, or tamped clay, hollow inside, with smoke channels running beneath its surface. Instead of wasting heat up a chimney, hot exhaust gases were directed through these chambers, saturating the entire structure with warmth. The bed would heat slowly, but it stayed hot for hours, radiating gentle, consistent heat heaven. Long after the fire was out, winters could be so punishing that homes relied on this system not only for comfort but for life itself in northern China. The Kong was not a luxury. It was a survival technology. Generations of builders refined its design, flues arranged to maximize heat retention, smooth airflow and safe venting. The platform became the center of family life, sleeping, sitting, eating, repairing tools all done on the heated Kong. When our pioneer reached his new homestead, he immediately recognized the climate's similarity. Dry, deep cold, temperatures plunging far below freezing, and firewood that demanded endless labor to harvest. Instead of copying local settlers, he built a system inspired directly by the Kang. But, unlike the long platforms the Chinese used, he built a compact version size to fit under his bunk. He dug a shallow cavity in the cabin floor, lined it with clay bricks, and constructed a raised platform with a hollow interior. A small firebox outside the bunk fed hot gases into a network of channels beneath the platform. The smoke then exited through a short flue, releasing cleanly outside. The key was efficiency. Instead of losing heat straight up a chimney, his system captured nearly everything the fire produced. Neighbors didn't understand it. Some thought sleeping above fire gases was dangerous. Others joked that his foreign bed stove would never work in the harsh frontier cold. But the pioneer trusted what he had seen overseas a method tested for thousands of years, refined by communities who endured winters just as severe. He believed that with proper airflow and brickwork, his version of the Kong would outperform any iron stove. Dot. And when the first winter storm arrived, he learned just how right he was. The platform heated slowly at dusk, and as he banked the fire and let it burn down, the bricks radiated a deep, soothing warmth into his bedding. While other settlers rose repeatedly to add fuel to their stoves, he slept undisturbed, enveloped in gentle radiant heat long after the flames were gone. He measured the results by morning, consistent warmth, a cabin free from frost inside, and most, shockingly just a fraction of his usual firewood pile consumed. This was no myth, it was no experiment, it was ancient engineering meeting frontier necessity, and it worked better than anything the region had seen. The pioneer's adaptation of the Kong bed stove did not happen overnight. It took observation, trial, and a firm understanding of how Chinese builders perfected the system. In northern China, Kong structures were typically large, often spanning an entire side of a family home. They were formed from sun-dried bricks, stone, or thick rammed earth, all materials chosen for their exceptional thermal mass. The goal of a Kong was simple, absorb as much heat as possible, then release it slowly over many hours. This was entirely different from how a metal stove behaved, iron heated fast but it also cooled fast. Once a pioneer's fire burned out, the cabin's temperature dropped quickly, causing discomfort, disrupted sleep, and even mild hypothermia among the very old or very young. A Kong avoided this because it was not the fire that heated the sleeper, it was the mass beneath the bed, storing warmth like a battery. Our pioneer had taken careful notes during his travels. He had watched craftsmen smooth clay coatings across the Kong's surface, ensuring airtight tunnels below. 
He remembered how they connected the structure to simple cooking stoves or small earthen fireboxes in some villages. A single fire first heated a pot, then the smoke byproduct traveled through the Kong before exiting the home. Nothing was wasted. When he reconstructed the idea on the frontier, he made important adjustments. Unlike the large platforms of China, he needed one suited to a small rugged cabin. So he scaled down the design, building a compact rectangle just large enough for his sleeping area. He lined the interior channels with stacked brick and sealed the joints with clay mixed with straw, replicating the insulating mix used for centuries. One detail he preserved exactly from the Chinese version was the shape of the internal flue paths. Rather than a straight channel, the pioneer built a winding path that forced hot gases to circulate, transferring more heat to the brick. This design ensured the bed stayed warm well past dawn, while the locals chopped endless logs to keep their iron stoves running. He perfected his routine, a single controlled burn before sunset. The fire heated the Kong's internal mass, and by the time he was ready for sleep, the firebox was nearly empty yet the warmth was just beginning to rise. Cracks between cabin logs frosted over outside, but under his blankets he felt a comfort equal to, or even greater than, beds in heated modern homes. Reports from neighboring settlers at the time described genuine astonishment. One visitor wrote that his cabin held warmth like an oven stone, and that touching the surface of the bed felt like the sun had settled into the bricks. Another described entering his cabin hours after the fire had gone out and finding the air warmer than any home heated by an iron stove. But the most extraordinary observation was his fuel savings. While a typical family burned through piles of wood each week, he consumed barely two-fifths of that amount. The math showed an average of 60% less firewood used per winter month. That difference was not just a matter of convenience it freed days of labor otherwise spent chopping, splitting, and hauling. Such efficiency stemmed from the Kong's engineering. The system channeled exhaust heat into the bed stove instead of wasting it. Unlike metal stoves that vented heat rapidly up a chimney, the Kong's low winding passages kept the heat where it was needed most. It was not a new principle it was a centuries-old tradition honed in regions where winter life depended on stretching every scrap of fuel. The pioneer's neighbors eventually recognized the practicality. Though some remained skeptical, others asked him to help design versions of the bed stove for their own cabins. He obliged, teaching them how flue length, brick thickness, and clay seals affected performance. Some families adopted the design fully. Others improvised hybrid systems, combining their existing stoves with short Kong-style channels beneath benches or smaller sleeping nooks. This exchange of knowledge echoed what historians now understand. Frontier innovation often came not from local invention, but from global observation. An idea developed a continent away could become the perfect solution for conditions thousands of miles west. The Kong bed stove was one such idea quiet, simple, efficient, and far ahead of its time. As winters continued, the pioneer's adaptation of the Chinese Kang became legendary across the region. His methods proved that ancient solutions could outperform even the iron stoves that settlers believed were the pinnacle of frontier heating. Travelers, trappers, and wandering surveyors sometimes stayed overnight in his cabin, leaving surprised at how evenly the warmth persisted. Unlike metal stoves that created localized heat, the Kong produced a stable thermal environment. Its radiant warmth rose gently, eliminating the sharp temperature differences between floor and roof that many settlers were accustomed to. In ordinary cabins, one could feel cold feet and an overheated face at the same time, but inside his near the air was balanced, with the center of comfort right where a person slept. Historical accounts described that the Kang also offered a healthier form of warmth. Instead of breathing dry, hot air blown off an iron stove, the sleeper rested on a slowly warming mass that kept humidity more stable. Those who spent nights on his Kang often remarked that they woke with clear sinuses and no smoke smell in their clothing. A sharp contrast to the smoky interiors typical of frontier life. Importantly, the system's longevity was extraordinary. Many Kongs in China lasted through multiple generations with only minor repairs. The pioneer experienced the same, apart from occasional resealing of flue joints or smoothing of clay surfaces. The bed stove required almost no maintenance. Its mass was its strength immune to cracking from rapid heat fluctuations and resistant to the corrosion that destroyed metal. Stoves over time, the true turning point came when a particularly harsh winter struck. Temperatures plunged far lower than anyone expected, and several families struggled to keep enough wood on hand. Some even burned furniture to survive the coldest nights. But the pioneer, using the same modest supply of firewood he always depended on, remained warm. His Kong had stored so much heat during early evening burns that he slept through nights where other cabins dropped below freezing inside. It was then that the rest of the settlement began to understand the value of this foreign technology. What they once dismissed as odd or unnecessary had proven superior to their own methods. The idea that a centuries-old Chinese invention could outperform modern ironwork challenged their assumptions about what mattered. Most, not complexity or shine, but efficiency and design. As the pioneer shared what he knew, 
More homesteads adopted versions of the Kong bed stove clay workers in the region began experimenting with new brick types. Some settlers built full-length heated platforms. Others constructed narrow heated bunks for infants or elders. A few even integrated cooking stoves into their Kong systems, just as northern Chinese families had done for generations. Over time, people realized that this heating method changed the rhythm of winter life. No more rising in the darkness to feed the stove. No more anxious nights wondering whether a fire would survive until dawn. No more exhausting days spent cutting wood just to keep up with the cold. The Kong gave families back control of their evenings and their energy. The broader lesson echoed across the frontier. Innovation did not always come from new inventions. Sometimes, the answer had already existed for hundreds or thousands of years waiting for someone open-minded enough to recognize its value. The Kong bed stove was a perfect example of a technology shaped by a climate nearly identical to that of many frontier settlements. It was not a curiosity. It was a practical, proven, deeply intelligent solution. By the end of his life, the pioneer was widely respected for introducing the system. His journals recorded not pride, but gratitude gratitude that he had witnessed the Kong during his travels, and that he had trusted knowledge forged by another culture. His cabin remained warm long after he was gone, the bed stove still functional, still radiating heat each winter. Today, historians looking back on early frontier heating methods often cite his adaptation of the Kang as one of the most effective low-tech heating strategies ever used in the region. It was simple, rugged, and incredibly efficient and its success demonstrated the power of cultural exchange long before the word globalization ever existed. The Kong bed stove was more than a heated bed, it was a lifeline, a bridge between civilizations, and a reminder that wisdom does not belong to one place or time. When one pioneer placed that ancient Chinese technology beneath his bunk, he did more than save firewood, he proved that great ideas can survive across continents and centuries, warming not only homes but the human story itself.